Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopez, and today I'm joined by Dr. Edward Westerman. He's Professor of History at Texas A&M University in the USA, where he teaches courses related to modern and contemporary European history. He's the author of several books, and today we're going to focus on his new one, Drunk on Genocide, Alcohol and Mass Murder in Nazi Germany. So, Dr. Westerman, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Well, thank you very much, Ricardo, and thank you for the invitation to talk today about the book. My pleasure. Okay, so, I mean, uh, the book is about how alcohol, I guess, fueled genocide in Germany. Are there any historical precedents to this combination between alcohol and genocide? When we uh, talk specifically about genocide, uh, not really prior to this. If we look at the Armenian genocide, for example, we don't uh, we don't see that dynamic. Uh, I think the key thing that we do see with respect to alcohol use and widespread alcohol use by, uh, for example, uh, militaries, as you see, violence can uh, be associated with that. Aggressiveness, we know, uh, is part of that. But uh, I think really one of the um, one of the interesting things about that uh, conversation uh, is that there's a literal intoxication that you get from drinking uh, alcohol, but there's also this metaphorical intoxication of control and power over others. And so in that respect, I think, uh, you know, any genocide would qualify in the control and uh, uh, over those other individuals. Mm -hmm. But in terms of perpetrating violence more generally, are there any historical precedents or not? No, I, not, not necessarily. And uh, what's interesting about, the, about your question, too, is that uh, if, I look at, uh, if I look at the Holocaust and I look at the example of Nazi Germany, uh, the closest uh, that I've seen to that uh, is in Rwanda. And I talk a little bit about that in the book, about how there are many similarities between what occurred uh, in uh, the Nazi genocide of the Jews in Eastern Europe uh, and the Rwandan genocide. So it almost goes forward instead of going back. Mm -hmm. I understand. So are there any particular reasons why Germany, uh, Germans uh, resorted to alcohol to do these kinds of things? But, I mean, was it the case that before Nazi Germany, uh, in, uh, in Germany people were already used to drinking alcohol in large quantities or not? Yeah, I think that uh, in looking at this topic, one of the things that you see, at least in West, uh, Western culture, West European culture, uh, is the use of alcohol tied to conceptions of masculinity is one thing you see. And those conceptions of masculinity include things like being able to hold your drink, so drink, uh, uh, drink a lot without showing it amongst your peers, and the other thing that we see with respect uh, to heavy alcohol drinking is we see aggressive behavior. Uh, and if we look at uh, uh, if we look at the German context specifically, uh, one of the things that we would see in the 19th century and early 20th century uh, is that the Kneipen or bars uh, in Germany are sites of drinking, socialization, but also political mobilization, uh, and also in many cases, sites of political parties that are anti-Semitic. So you have this verbal rhetoric uh, that's uh, associated with uh, political uh, political mobilization. And in cases that does, uh, that does become the genesis uh, for uh, the catalyst uh, for actions or political violence. And that's what we're going to definitely see uh, with the stormtroopers uh, in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this heavy drinking of alcohol, was it mostly concentrated on people that were politically engaged or maybe, for example, the ones that were really part of the political system in Nazi, in Nazi Germany and perpetrated genocide or was it widespread among the general population? Well, in, in Germany, uh, beer is known as liquid bread, right? So uh, the idea of drinking, right, certainly drinking beer uh, is there. And what one sees in looking at uh, 
there's the whole idea of German regional particular er, particularism. So are the Saxons or the Bavarians or the Frisians, are they, uh, you know, do they like to drink? And if you ask them, they say yes. Right. So there's a very much a, there's very much now they might di uh, uh, drink different uh, different things. But what you see is you do definitely see this idea of widespread alcohol consumption, especially of beer, uh, becomes a, a major intoxicant. And what does that mean? Well, it means it's a manifestation of many behaviors. So it's a manifestation of one's camaraderie with those that one associates with, uh, in, and especially in those bar scenes uh, th uh, that we're discussing. Uh, and it's also a manifestation of one's own ability to drink. Uh, when I was in Germany, for example, uh, in the 2000s, there was a gentleman, uh, I think it was about uh, about literally about 200 kilos, uh, maybe uh, 180 kilos, and he was known as the Kornkönig, so the schnapps, the schnapps king in Germany, right? And that, and he had his own bar there, and people, uh, that's how they referred to him. So I think you see that dynamic uh, in German culture uh, and in other uh, European and, and U.S. cultures at different times as well. Mm -hmm. But was the consumption of alcohol promoted in any way by the Nazi regime itself? Yeah, that's a uh, that's an interesting question because actually uh, the health uh, the health minister Leonard Conti, uh, when uh, the Nazis come to power, one of the things that he's concerned about is drinking and tobacco use. And uh, so what you have is you have what's known as the Getränkefrage, which is the drinking question. Uh, and the idea is that uh, alcohol consumption and tobacco use is recognized uh, as something that is uh, harmful to people's health. And so you have a regime, or at least part of a regime, in this case the health minister, who's trying to lead uh, more of a abstinence campaign uh, uh, for both alcohol and tobacco, when in fact, if we look at the numbers actually, after the Nazis take uh, uh, take power, uh, the consumption of alcohol actually increases quite substantially. And it's going to increase uh, into the war as well. Uh, and what we're going to see with that is when, for example, the French, uh, the, the French are defeated, French cognac, French wines, massive quantities of French champagne are going to be sent to Germany as kind of, if you will, part of the plunder that takes place. And uh, then we're also going to see uh, this in increased consum consumption, especially at the fighting fronts. Mm -hmm. But were there any other drugs associated with these kinds of behaviors like genocide and violence more generally, or was alcohol really the main one? Yeah, uh, in, in, in my research, alcohol for the SS and police especially is the primary, if you will, drug or intoxicant of choice. Uh, some of your viewers definitely will be familiar with Norman Oler's, uh, the German journalist uh, book, Blitzed is the English ch title where he looks at pervitin uh, and methamphetamine to talk about uh, to talk about how soldiers use that. And uh, what I found actually is very interesting that uh, Himmler will uh, writes a number of times in directives about trying to moderate alcohol use uh, among his SS and policemen. But I haven't found one reference, for example, to narcotic or methamphetamine in those files. So uh, I think what we see is that uh, the intoxicant of choice uh, in the SS and the police is definitely alcohol. Mm -hmm. But did this happen also with uh, troops? I mean, with the army or was it something that was more focused on, for example, the SS, the SA and people who were part of the concentration and labor camps? It absolutely, uh, it absolutely is seen in the army uh, as well. And what one needs to kind of keep in mind is if we uh, were in Germany in 1934, there would be about 3 million members of the SA, the stormtroopers. And what's going to happen uh, to the great majority of those by 1939? Well, they're going to be called into the army. So what we see is the behaviors uh, of the stormtroopers, especially their use of alcohol, their social bonding and using of alcohol as kind of that for camaraderie, for a performative masculinity, for violence against communists, for example, we're going to see those same individuals uh, who are going to be part of the Wehrmacht 
And we're going to see many of those same behaviors that are going to be transferred uh, into the army as well. Mm -hmm. But who is it that the Nazi regime at least exp explicitly condemned alcohol consumption, even though they knew that it was pervasive or not? Well, the, I think there's, it, there's, two, there's about two answers to that. First of all, there's an official position, and many, uh, and many uh, know that Hitler himself is not a drinker. He doesn't drink alcohol. Now, he does take bitters after eating, which is an alcohol-based uh, uh, based drink, uh, but he's not what we would consider. He's not a beer drinker. He's not a wine drinker. At, uh, in the uh, bunker at the end of, uh, at the, end of the war, uh, there are reports about Hitler starting to drink cognac for for example, but uh, so we have this picture of a, a of Hitler who doesn't drink. We have this official campaign uh, to uh, moderate drinking, especially for women, young women. Uh, this is a gender this is a gender norm that we see. Uh, the quote unquote good young German girl doesn't drink or, or doesn't smoke. Now that's the campaign. That's the official rhetoric. But when we get into the actual activities uh, of individuals in that society. Alcohol plays a significant role, uh, as I talk about, with respect to building that group camaraderie, uh, uh, building that kind of sense of self, and, and that those masculine values are associated with drinking. And that's recognized uh, by, for example, Alfred Rosenberg, uh, who becomes the head of the Eastern Ministries. He actually talks about this in an article he writes where he's arguing against uh, this um, uh, this idea that the paradigm should be of uh, the, the guy who can drink the other guy under the table. But in fact, what we see is the cultural use of alcohol is very important in the German context, and it continues and increases despite what the government says or Hitler's own example. Mm -hmm. Do we know if soldiers and other people needed alcohol to to perpetrate these kinds of violence against the Jews and against other armies, for example? Or was it simply some sort of uh, social phenomena where they would drink alcohol because they would perform those kinds of violence in groups? Yeah, there's, uh, there's about five different reasons that alcohol is consumed. So when we look at it, I talk about, for example, social celebration, social camaraderie. That's one we've, we, we've talked about. There's also the ritual of drinking, kind of these ideas, for example, uh, in the German military, in the SS and police, there are these fellowship evenings in which alcohol is incorporated along with music, for example, uh, in a way to try to build, again, that camaraderie. We also see that alcohol can be used to disinhibit action. So, for example, uh, there are uh, there are individuals who drink in order to be able to do something, mm -hmm. killing children, for example, uh, executing women. Those are uh, those are hurdles that some individuals use alcohol in order to be able to overcome. We also see alcohol used as a facilitator. So, uh, when I talk about facilitation. One of the examples that I use uh, in the book is it's a it's it's a New Year's Eve and it's in the East. It's in uh, Poland and there's a group of policemen who are celebrating New Year's Eve by drinking. And what they decide to do is after it's midnight, after the new year uh, has actually uh, come, they decide to go into the nearby ghetto and kill Jews. The first thing that they want to do uh, to start the new year is what they've been doing in the past, which is to murder people. And I think that that's a very specific use of alcohol as a facilitator uh, for violence. So that celebratory ritual was there. Mm -hmm. And if we look at uh, really the final and most pre probably most prevalent narrative of alcohol use under the Third Reich is coping. So there's, a, if you look at the historiography and, and many of the historians who've looked at this, normally if they talk about alcohol use, they're talking about, well, the perpetrators uh, were so uh, affected by what they did that they had to drink to cope with their uh, to cope with their actions. And that has become the dominant narrative uh, uh, of alcohol use in the Third Reich. And it makes sense for a couple reasons. Uh, number one, if uh, especially after the war, if individuals were um, uh, were in, uh, interrogated or interviewed about their actions, uh, 
uh, they if they if there was evidence that they participated, they could use alcohol use as a mitigating factor. Uh, and I think the other thing is for us as historians, we can't necessarily imagine that people could enjoy being involved in some of these acts, as I talk about in the book, and they could celebrate it with food and drink. Uh, and so we immediately think, oh, yeah, the only way they could do that was coping because that's what our mindset, that's what our that's what our uh, initial thought would be. And uh, so one of the key things that this book does uh, is it says we need to complicate our understanding about alcohol use uh, in the East, especially and by the SS and police to look at it in a broader range of types of behaviors than merely coping or merely they needed to drink in order to be able uh, to do their duties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking that perhaps this example of genocide in Nazi, in Nazi Germany could give us or could tell us anything about uh, if it's hard for people to commit these sorts of violence, even against enemies. I mean, if they really need to get intoxicated to do it, or if by getting intoxicated, it's easier for them to do it. Uh, yeah, and I think that that's a, uh, that's a good question in terms of, I think it's a little bit of both, and I think it depends on the individual. So there are individuals who, in fact, right, they need that uh, they need that alcohol in order to be able to do what they do. However, in the book, I talk about many, many examples of individuals uh, who are using alcohol in, in that celebratory role. And, and they're uh, they're, for example, if they're at a grave site, if they're at a killing site, uh, they're they're shooting individuals and then they're going to a table and they're eating and they're drinking and there might be music playing and then they go back to the killing site. And so when we see those types of behaviors, uh, it's very clear uh, that alcohol is being incorporated uh, in the type of atmosphere that we would consider to be our sports team, our soccer team just won uh, just won the championship, so we're going to celebrate, or we're in the we're in the uh, the finals, or we're going to you know have a party around it. So that type of celebratory uh, uh, environment that accompanies some of these actions is really one of the most striking things uh, about the book. Mm -hmm. Were some of these phenomena considered rituals? Can we consider them rituals? Because if so, maybe I was just thinking that perhaps some of them would by themselves also lead to altered states or uh, altered psychological states, right? Yeah, uh, and they are rituals. And one of the things that uh, uh, the uh, anthropologist David Kurtzer has talked about with respect to Nazi Germany is that Nazi Germany incorporated numerous rituals, right? Uh, and probably for the viewers, some of the uh, the most famous or infamous would be the Nuremberg Party rallies, which has rituals, uh, uh, mass rituals, which has rituals within rituals. We think about, for example, as historians of the Third Reich, those torchlights parades in Berlin. But these rituals are, are part of the Nazi Party's mobilization of German society. And so the rituals that take place in the SA and the SS are very important uh, uh, to the actions and the identity uh, of those groups. And um, one of the things that you see, for example, is if you have individuals who participate in these drinking rituals, let's say after uh, a major killing action. If there's an individual who says they don't want to drink, uh, that individual is not only refusing to drink with the group, but it's perceived by the group as uh, that individual is rejecting what the group was involved in. And so uh, these rituals mean more uh, than, uh, than just acceptance. You know, if you don't accept, if you don't participate, uh, essentially you're, you're ostracizing yourself from the group. And so I think that that's important how, how powerful rituals can be uh, in, uh, in forming this group identity and also in forming expectations of the individuals in the group. Mm -hmm. So earlier you mentioned masculinity. So would you say that the Nazi regime was particularly appealing to males or to people with masculine traits? Yeah, I think one of the uh, one of the things we see in Nazi Germany is these really clear distinctions in gender roles. So for men, toughness, 
hardness. And, and Hitler has these famous quotes about Hitler youth, the boys, you know, being as hard as Kupstahl and, uh, uh, you know, as fast as, you know, uh, as a hound. Right. So he makes these uh, he makes these ideas about toughness and hardness. That is part and parcel of the SS identity as well. And so what you see there with the SS in particular, I talk about hyper masculinity. And what I mean by that is there's a glorification of the military, so a militarized masculinity, those who are uh, those who are willing to use their weapons, capable of using their weapons, uh, this uh, exaltation of war and conflict is part of that. And then you see this idea of performative masculinity that's tied into that. And uh, as I talk about in numerous places, individuals who will count and compete with each other for number of victims shot, individuals who will be involved in horrific uh, acts of sexual assault, who count the number uh, that they're involved in and will boast about that uh, uh, amongst their colleagues. And the idea being that if one is able to do more of that, then one is harder or tougher uh, than one's peers. And we also see that dynamic before the war in the concentration camps uh, amongst the SS guards as well. So this, these masculine values are these hyper-masculine values that are tied to ideas of war and race, uh, for example. And then uh, they're also in comparison to these feminine values. And the, the feminine values, the idea of women uh, as caregivers, but also essentially uh, as individuals who are to have children, right? So the, your ability to also impregnate women uh, is a standard of uh, masculinity uh, that we also see in the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. So these sort of hyper-masculine traits, aren't they also associated with the ideal Aryan men that Hitler and other higher ranks have? That would be, that's exactly, that's exactly correct. So it is, it's a socially constructed uh, ideal. Uh, and of course, not everyone is going to uh, meet that ideal, but the idea is that many attempt to meet that ideal, right? And that's the key thing that they strive to, uh, they strive to meet that ideal. Mm -hmm. So is there any relationship, I think you've already alluded to this before, but is there any relationship between alcohol consumption and political organization uh, prior to the rise of the Nazi regime in Germany? Yes, uh, definitely. And uh, those, the, those uh, political pubs, for example, those drinking pubs that are based on political affiliation, especially in large urban, uh, large urban centers, we see working class uh, we see working class bars. Uh, we see uh, this uh, kind of mobilization of those individuals. And one of the things that I think is important to note, that's not only happening, for example, uh, sites of masculinity and, and, and mobilization and kind of male aggression. Yeah, that's not only happening in Germany at the time. If we were to go to New York, uh, in the 1940s, and we were to go to working class bars in New York, we would see the very same thing where uh, those sites uh, become male dominated sites. Women aren't allowed in those sites in the 1940s. And if they're allowed in, they're, they're put in a back room. And men show that they can drink, but they also show that they can use their fists. And those are kind of the markers, if you will, of masculinity uh, in, uh, in the time period amongst certain groups and classes. So I think it's important to note that we see this prior to the Nazis uh, coming to power in Germany, but we also see it in other contexts and other societies as well. Could that have had something to do with the economic crisis in the late 20s? Yeah, yeah, even though alcohol is um, is expensive uh, relative, it's a luxury good, I, I do think that one of the things that we see in times of economic downturn, and we even see that uh, in different periods uh, in the United States, and Russia has its own uh, experience with this as well, is that drinking uh, becomes kind of a substitute uh, that many reach for the bottle, if you will, uh, in uh, down times as a way to cope with what they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And even with the prohibitions like we have, for example, in the U.S., right? Yeah, even then, right, uh, you see that uh, those, uh, those prohibitions, you see that, uh, you know, criminality comes out of that in terms of uh, the, uh, the uh, bootlegging or uh, transportation uh, of alcohol. Now, I think, again, that's, um, uh, 
uh, there was a, there was an attempt in Germany uh, by some groups to kind of limit, not get rid of uh, uh, drinking in Germany. So there have been movements in Germany uh, in the 1920s, for example, 1930s, uh, to temperance movements to decrease the the amount of alcohol. But they weren't ever very successful in that in those terms. Mm -hmm. So in the book you mentioned that geography also played the role in attitudes people have had toward alcohol consumption and masculine traits. Could you tell us about it? Yeah, uh, I think what's important to note is when we think about uh, what's happening uh, under the National Socialist, uh, a couple of things we look at is situation, we look at chronology, and we look at geography. And uh, if we look at the East, uh, the occupied East, so if we're looking at Poland, if we're looking at uh, the Baltic states, uh, the occupied parts of Russia, Ukraine, uh, for example, Belarus, uh, one of the things that we see in those, uh, in those areas is they're described as zones of exception by a historian, meaning that uh, German occupation troops do things there that they might not have been able to get, uh, uh, to get away with. Uh, in Germany proper at the time, Nazi Germany proper. And we see that in a number of ways. Uh, we see it, for example, in acts of sexual violence and where we have Jewish women and Slavic women uh, who, uh, who are assaulted. And if we think about uh, a, a German SS and police study uh, that estimated at least 50% of SS and policemen had been involved in those types of activities uh, in the East. One of the things that we see from uh, more current historiography is it's a widespread action. Uh, and these actions uh, are incorporated under the idea I talk about, uh, that metaphorical intoxication, the power of the occupier over the occupied. And it doesn't necessarily mean that someone had to be drinking specifically for that to happen, although there are numerous accounts of uh, alcohol being consumed by those who are involved uh, in these actions. But the idea of conquest over inferior peoples and control over those inferior peoples, uh, we see that. In a good point of comparison, for example, in thinking about how the East is different, if we were to look at occupied France, for example, there are, uh, there are examples of sexual assaults. There are cases of sexual violence against French women, but it's punished much differently in the West. So uh, for example, I, have a, a, I talk about a case where a Wehrmacht soldier uh, had uh, sexually assaulted a, a girl and the general, the presiding general uh, of that soldier orders his execution the next day and then orders that the town, the French town mayor and French public officials be present to witness the execution. And so uh, we see the way in which um, the way in which racial ideas, for example, uh, the conception of the other and geography, geography plays much different roles between the East and the West. Mm -hmm. But would these be people in any way adapting or reacting to the geographical features of the environment they lived in? Like, for example, would there be any differences between people who lived in more mountainous places uh, when compared to the others? No, I don't think it so much uh, matters for topography in this case okay. or geography. I think it, uh, it's related uh, to the idea that the individuals are in those areas in power now in those areas. And it's also related, one of the things that uh, I talk about is we think about the way uh, that the campaign in the East was posited. We have a series of criminal orders that allow uh, a wide latitude on the types of behaviors by the troops in the East that we don't see in the West. Now, the, uh, the place in which we, in the West, where we see some of this kind of violence is against, for example, resistance fighters. Uh, you see some of that type of violence. So if a group, a specific group, uh, is determined uh, to, be, uh, to be a target, then you can see some of that. But uh, the overall geography, I think, relates more to the overall mindset of racial war in the East versus the type of war that's fought in the West. Mm -hmm. I understand. So apart from violent behaviors, was alcohol associated with any other kinds of 
behaviors or rituals in Nazi Germany? Well, it, uh, it does get incorporated. The way that Himmler wants alcohol to be used is as a social bonding mechanism. So you have alcohol incorporated into SS, uh, for example, the solstice cere- uh, celebrations, their winter solstice celebrations. You see alcohol incorporated. You see it incorporated in these fellowship evenings. But uh, the way that Himmler uh, envisions the incorporation of alcohol is, again, as a uh, as something to raise the mood. But they're not supposed to uh, turn into these kinds of drunken orgies, if you will, or these drunk fests, he says. But uh, again, the ideal proves to be different uh, in in the East from the actual uh, from the actual ideal that Himmler and others talk about. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to genocide, was it something uh, that the the general population participated in, or was it only for people who were part of the sorts of institutions that were responsible for uh, going ahead with the plan of exterminating the Jews and other peoples? Yeah. So what happens? Uh, there's two really uh, uh, two parts to that uh, to that answer. What happens over the course of the war is alcohol does become a luxury good, and so what we see is that a lot of the alcohol, schnapps, for example, the distilled liquors, are sent to the east. Uh, they're not available as widely in Germany proper, but certainly not amongst uh, uh, German uh, civilians. A uh, bread, or excuse me, a uh, beer. Uh, is starting to be watered down, so it's diluted because of the uh, uh, non-availability. So within Germany proper, amongst the German civil population, we don't see that. However, uh, because the SS police and the Wehrmacht, the German armed forces, occupy a uh, uh, kind of a special position within German society, they're the beneficiaries of alcohol, right? So those those supplies are uh, are focused or funneled. Uh, to those individuals as a perquisite of their uh, of uh, of their uh, uh, service to the Reich, so that's where you start to see that alcohol becomes more widely available only in these kinds of groups uh, versus German society in general. Mm-hmm. Right. So in the book, you also associate uh, alcoholic intoxication with acts of humiliation per, uh, perpetrated toward Jews. Could you give us one or more examples of those acts of humiliation? Or, and were these also violent in a sense or not? Yeah. So it, it, there's, a, there's a range. Uh, and one of the things when I talk about rituals of humiliation, which is a, 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 a focus of one of the chapters in the book, is it mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily involve uh, alcohol use. So, for example, uh, many of your viewers will be familiar with pictures showing uh, German SS and policemen or German soldiers in Poland uh, cutting off the earlocks of Jews, uh, either with a bayonet or with scissors. Uh, there are cases uh, that we see, uh, for example, prior to the war, uh, where Jews are forced in Vienna to scrub the streets with toothbrushes, and we see some of those, uh, some of those uh, pictures again. Uh, in pogroms in Germany before the war. And that is what I would call uh, the metaphorical intoxication, again, my power over these individuals. Now, what we then start to see in the concentration camps, uh, for example, and this can be, this is before the war as well, where you have SS guards who do these rituals of humiliation during the day, but uh, in the camps, there's a camp canteen or uh, a club or bar for the, uh, the guards. So I have numbers of, uh, uh, of examples of where the SS guards would be drinking at night, uh, and then they'll decide to go into the camp or they'll decide to have prisoners uh, come uh, to the canteen in which they'll make them do uh, sport, uh, push-ups, uh, uh, knee bends, uh, uh, they'll make them bark like dogs or meow like cats. And so you'll see uh, the rituals of humiliation are then tied to, uh, to the drinking and the celebration uh, of, the specific, uh, of the specific guards. I have a case in Auschwitz uh, where I talk about a young woman, Ruth Elias, who was 20 years old. And she was in Block 6, Barrack 6, uh, in the Birkenau camp. And that was also the barrack that housed the the male orchestra. And she remembers uh, 
what happened uh, on several occasions. She could hear drunken singing SS guards coming to the barrack. And the first thing they would do upon coming into her barrack was to wake up the male orchestra and tell them to start playing music. And then once the music uh, started to play, they would start going after these young girls who were also uh, in, uh, in that barrack and grabbing them and sexually assaulting them. But Ruth Elias said the music had to play. She remembered that they staged these uh, sexual assaults by first saying that the orchestra had to play. So now we're starting to see uh, that these are rituals of violence, they're rituals of humiliation, uh, and they're tied to this celebratory uh, uh, feeling. We also noticed, uh, for example, in the book, I talk about a specific unit, Police Battalion 61, which is stationed at the Warsaw Ghetto. And they have their own Warsaw bar. They have their own bar outside the ghetto. So it's a police bar. And, and if you were to go to that bar, uh, the first thing you would see as you were trying to go inside was that they had a wooden door. And they have carved in notches of five. They have carved in the number of their victims that they've killed at the ghetto. And that will eventually be about 500 notches. If you open the door to that uh, in, into that bar and walked in, what would strike you about it is the policemen have created murals on the walls. And these are murals uh, showing policemen and showing caricatured figures of Jews, including one where a Jewish man is reaching down uh, to pick up uh, uh, some, uh, some potatoes and a policeman is behind him with his rifle leveled, getting ready to shoot him. And so they're sitting in a bar drinking uh, surrounded by these murals that uh, illustrate what they're doing, right, uh, in the ghetto, which is uh, involved in uh, the mass murder uh, of those Jewish uh, uh, of those Jewish inhabitants. So again, you, you you conceptualize what does it mean to sit at a table drinking beer or schnapps and singing uh, and celebrating uh, these actions. So there are a number of these kinds of examples uh, that I bring out. Uh, in the book that that show that it's about humiliation, but it's also about the control and power uh, over those other individuals. And that can be tied directly to drinking or can be tied to the power that the individuals enjoy. Mm -hmm. So these rituals also promoted social bonding, right? That's correct. And I think they're a key part of, uh, of this social bonding. And if we look at one of the things that uh, as a historian uh, that I thought was really important to do uh, with this uh, with this project was to look at social science literature. So uh, there's a great deal of literature uh, that's a contemporary literature that looks at uh, drinking in military units, uh, that looks at drinking and masculinity, that looks at drinking and aggression uh, and sexual violence, or even contemporary gang culture in the United States uh, that looks at how drinking is used. And Peggy Sanday, who is a, uh, a sociologist, she did a study uh, in the two, uh, early 2000s of a fraternity, uh, which is a US, uh, a US male fraternity. And uh, what she found is that they use drinking exactly for what you're talking about, to create camaraderie. But they also drink heavily because that's also to demonstrate their masculinity to the others, that they can drink more than, uh, uh, more than their comrades. And then you also saw uh, in her study that drinking was used uh, for uh, uh, group sexual violence. So gang rapes would, uh, would be uh, incorporated. And as she writes about this, she writes about it's more about the individuals being involved in the act to show uh, their, their, their allegiance to the group and their shared purpose in the group. And so what we see is if we look at some of the social science literature, we see that many of those kinds of behaviors uh, are also not just specific, let's say, to the U.S. in the 21st century, but we can see those same behaviors uh, of group violence and group bonding, group sexual violence in, uh, in the East, especially uh, during, uh, during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So could it be that these rituals would also uh, reinforce support for the Nazi regime, at least for the people that participated in them? Yeah, I think that uh, the rituals wouldn't have happened if the, if the ideology, the racial ideology, had not been part and parcel of creating their identity. 
So I think we start first with this idea of racialized uh, uh, superiority uh, and the othering of these other groups. Uh, that leads to the belief in one's superiority and one's right uh, of conquest, right? So if we were to think, you know, we see that in other uh, in other uh, in other contexts as well, right? Uh, conquistadors, right? For example, in the New World, right? Um, uh, you know, this idea of uh, of conquest and control. Uh, and it can be for other reasons. It can be to bring civilization in quotation marks uh, or Christianity uh, uh, to other peoples. But it's ultimately about their feeling that what they're doing is right because it's justified for a higher purpose. And I think that that's very clearly uh, the, the overarching matrix of what Nazism uh, kind of posits. And these men then create, uh, build on that, uh, build on that feeling uh, for the actions uh, in the things that they do. Mm -hmm. So do you think that uh, by studying how people behaved in these contexts in Nazi Germany, we can, we can arrive at some conclusions in terms of how our human nature works more generally. I mean, because these are really, I mean, obscene things that we're talking about and people were able to perpetrate them and even had fun with them. Right. Yeah, I think that this is uh, that that's really ultimately one of the uh, one of the most profound questions. What does it tell us about human nature? And I think as uh, as a Holocaust a scholar, as a, a scholar of genocide, I think we're always trying to understand how is it that these behaviors uh, can lead to these kinds of atrocious and horrific events. And I think what it does show us is, is it does show us that when we start to create these conditions and we start uh, to create these groups who are in quote unquote inferior or not deserving of societal protect, society's protection, right? Or we start to uh, posit them as dangers to our society. Uh, what we start to create is a mental uh, outlook uh, that in which uh, that dehumanization uh, that we see uh, in the Holocaust, that starts to spread. And it may not mean that everyone in the society is willing to go to the extremes uh, of, uh, of individuals that we see in the SS and police, but it, what it does mean is that they're more willing to accept that vision of the other and means that they no longer guarantee the protection uh, to those other groups. So I think that this is one of the key things that we deal with when we talk about, when we talk about genocide, but I think it's also uh, something we can talk about in colonialism and colonial history, right? Uh, is to how did colonial powers view the others? Uh, uh, you know, whether it's uh, uh, whether it's uh, uh, you know Angola, for example, whether it's Mexico, whether it's uh, you know Peru, no, wherever these take place, or the New World in the United States, for example, in the U.S. West, I've talked about how are Native Americans viewed, uh, for example, uh, by those settlers who come in uh, to the West. So this is, I think, the crux of thinking about what this shows us. We can see these kinds of behaviors. And when the state starts to become involved in promoting those behaviors, that's where you reach, I think, a very, very dangerous tipping point. So the state authority, when it starts to condone those types of behaviors, that's where you can see genocide. Mm -hmm. So you think that maybe all peoples could be, I mean, uh, th that they could be willing to commit these kinds of acts in the right circumstances? I mean, this is not something that is exclusive to Nazi Germany or any other regime, right? No, that's exactly correct. So, for example, if we were to look at uh, World War II in the Pacific, one of the things we know very clearly is not only do uh, U.S. servicemen have racial perceptions and racialized perceptions of Japanese, but very much that Japanese have racialized perceptions of uh, inferior, right, uh, Caucasians, all right, in this case, uh, that, uh, so th that it works, right, it works across a society, but where does it come from? It comes from an overarching belief that's tied in with propaganda, that's tied in with state policy and pronouncements by state leaders. And uh, I think, you know, again, if we were to go to Rwanda, when we start to think about 
uh, how, in fact, uh, propaganda is used to describe uh, Tutsis as cockroaches, for example, by, uh, by Hutu extremists in that period. So we start to see the way in which uh, the way in which the state, uh, the media becomes involved in trans and the transmission of these kind, kinds of ideas. It can happen anywhere. And obviously, as we see even today, uh, if we look at the Middle East and we think about the Yazidis uh, in Iraq, right? If we think about what's happening in, to, to a degree in Syria uh, or uh, in Myanmar, right? We see again uh, many of these very same dynamics that are at play. Mm -hmm. Do we know specifically what led to the rise of the Nazi regime? Because, I mean, different people point to different causes, like, for example, the sanctions the German people were subject to after World War I, the economic crisis, social turmoil, and all of those kinds of things. But, uh, I mean, in this book, do you point to any, I mean, to any possible causes of why the Nazi regime arose? Uh, that's been a that's been obviously as you just noted there's been a, a number of uh, kind of reasons that have been put forward certainly what I do say uh, what I would say uh, is without the loss of World War one there is no way uh, that you would see someone like Hitler come to power a, a corporal uh, uh, who doesn't have an education now what happens after World War one well there's certainly a feeling amongst German nationalists of this feeling uh, that uh, they've been singled out as the guilty parties when when many others are, are guilty. The uh, economic crises that in some uh, in, in some part is related to reparations and the crisis that takes place in Germany uh, is partially responsible, or at least it's going to be used by German nationalists. Uh, the occupation of areas, the loss of territories, uh, the loss of the German military, uh, at least it's uh, it's uh, it, it's greatly constricted size to only a hundred thousand. So I think all of these things are used by parties of both, in some cases, the left and the right, uh, to justify uh, to justify uh, change. Uh, so when you have those kinds of what we would consider major. Uh, uh, crises uh, in in a country, uh, you know, we can see we can see the uh, the demand for political change can happen. I think we we continue to see that kind of dislocation in our contemporary world when we just think about economic dislocation. What does it what is what does it mean when your economy crashes? Are people more willing to look for other types of solutions? And uh, you know, if you add then. Uh, if you find an enemy, if you're able, as the Nazis were to do, they identified this enemy of socialists and uh, Jews. And then now you add that to the other crises and you started to have a dynamic uh, of kind of accelerating uh, blaming. And then you use political violence and you create a you create an army, a party army like the S.A. So now you're able to uh, to use that uh, that group and some of the. Uh, controls of state structures start to break down. So I think it's a, it's quite a uh, quite a number of things uh, in the German case that all work together uh, that lead to the Nazi assumption of power. Uh, and uh, so it's a very difficult it's a very difficult question to answer. I think definitively. Maybe perhaps also the influence of certain intellectuals. I mean, perhaps their ideas resonated back at the time. Uh, for example, people, when they talk about Nazi Germany, they mention uh, the influence of ideas coming from Nietzsche, Heidegger and others like that. Yeah, you know, one of the interesting one of the interesting things about Nazi Germany, in my mind, is uh, that uh, really the Nazi Party doesn't come up with anything really original. For example, the term Aryan comes from 19th century racialist theories like uh, Gobineau, Houston, Stuart Chamberlain uses these kinds of these kinds of terms. So what what Hitler and the Nazi Party are able to do to uh, to to address your question directly is kind of take things that already exist. Uh, and uh, kind of incorporate them uh, into the party uh, into the party platform. Uh, for example, racial anti-Semitism is certainly not something that the Nazis uh, come up with, but they're also able to leverage uh, Christian anti-Semitism, economic anti-Semitism, social anti-Semitism that predate uh, the Nazi seizure of power. And so all this, you know, this uh, this kind of being opportunist. Uh, and uh, also being lucky 
in certain respects, right? The, so the fact that Hitler is appointed uh, chancellor, that uh, that von Papen uh, is able to get Hindenburg to agree to make that appointment because he thinks he can control him. These are things that could have gone the other direction, uh, especially since we do know that in 1932, uh, that uh, from the July to the December elections, right, uh, the Nazi party is losing voters. It's still a very large party, but it's lost, uh, you know, it's lost a significant percentage of its voters in that uh, in that election, about 5%. So it makes a difference, right, uh, that these things happen when they do. Mm -hmm. So one particular kind of violence we haven't talked about yet, and I guess happens in all wars more or less, has to do with uh, raping of women or sexual predation. So did this also happen in occupied territories and was it also associated with alcohol consumption? Uh very often, uh, in looking at uh, in looking at the actual uh, testimony, uh, survivor accounts, for example, or witness testimony, you do see alcohol being associated uh, with sexual violence, and um, I think that that makes sense. Uh, probably uh, based on our own, if we look at the contemporary world and look at some sociological studies, uh, the use of alcohol and increased propensity for violence against women. We see that in a number of different uh, contexts, and it's no different. Uh, it's no different in the East. Uh, one of the things, though, that makes it, the East a little bit different is there's uh, there's not necessarily anything that's going to lead uh, to the punishment of the perpetrator, right? So uh, uh, the perpetrators, in many cases, are in a position where they know or feel relatively secure that they'll never be. Uh, that they'll never be punished for it. So you then add that uh, to uh, uh, to the drinking, uh, and you see that it can create its own dynamic. And in fact, when some of these individuals who are uh, brought up for disciplinary uh, procedures, one of the things that the judges look at is they say, well, there's really not an opportunity. They're in the East, for example. They really haven't had an opportunity uh, for sexual, uh, uh, to have sexual outlet there. So, you know, this is something that we, uh, that we probably can expect and probably excuse. So they also blame the victim in many cases where you have uh, some of these trials where the women, uh, well, she didn't really, you know, she didn't really uh, express disagreement or she didn't fight hard enough, or she wasn't really hurt. Yeah, you, you, I've seen that. You know, she re didn't really have any lasting injuries uh, from these assaults. So you again see this, uh, this very, uh, this very racialized uh, mindset uh, talking about uh, these women as being it's uh, as being themselves the reason for these uh, for these attacks. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, talking specifically about concentration camps, uh, these sorts of violence we've been talking about, do we also see them occurring in concentration camps? Like, for example, the sort of rit uh, ritualized murders fueled by alcohol and, and things like that? One of, we, one of the things we see is we see competition. So, uh, for example, I talk about uh, this idea of uh, uh, guards, SS guards in certain camps, where they would make a, a prisoner hold a glass, uh, and uh, they would take uh, they would take turns at shooting the glass out of the hands of the prisoner to demonstrate their skill to another guard, and maybe even a, a bet that would involve alcohol uh, as a result uh, as a result of that. And you can imagine. Uh, what that would mean for that prisoner, for example, in one case, if the prisoner was wounded, uh, then the prisoner was then executed. Uh, and uh, it, you also have competitions in the case of who can beat prisoners better, uh, one or or the other. Uh, you see, uh, you see this uh, kind of performative masculinity that I've talked about in the camps, and it's often tied, especially at nights. Uh, where you see that the SS guards had been drinking in their canteen, uh, and that's when they come up with ways in which to torture the prisoners, humiliate the prisoners, uh, sexual violence against the prisoners takes place uh, in, in some of those cases uh, as well. So it's part of that kind of festive ritual, what I call that facilitation of violence uh, that alcohol causes.
Mm-hmm. And in the war context, during wars, did soldiers use alcohol in preparation for war or something like that? Yeah, you know, in the history, in military history, we talk about the, the Dutch courage, right? The idea that the, the rum or grog ration used by many navies, the British Navy, uh, uh, the Dutch Navy, uh, is is kind of uh, is kind of used. Uh, I think what uh, what we see is that alcohol is used amongst uh, military troops uh, as a way uh, as a way in some cases to deal with uh, deal with anxiety certainly, but mm-hmm. also as a way uh, to kind of uh, uh, take off some of the pressure that they've experienced as a result of, of combat. So what you will you, what you can see in the east uh, is this use of drinking uh, amongst one's comrades to kind of decompress. Now, when you do that, uh, when you start that uh, uh, that process again, it also depends uh, in the context. So uh, there are cases where uh, individuals who start drinking, if there are women around, uh, they may uh, they may engage in uh, acts of sexual violence. Or they may engage in acts of aggression against other men. Uh, but what I don't necessarily see. Uh, in, in in great detail or in a number of examples would be the use of alcohol prior to going into combat. So, for example, the Soviet uh, the Soviet uh, infantry uh, uh, men have actually an, uh, a vodka ration, uh, and that is drunk in some cases before actually going into combat. But uh, it's not to incapacitate them. It's more as a way uh, to kind of motivate, uh, uh, you know, to kind of at least uh, uh, a certain amount of um, uh, a certain amount of disinhibition takes place with that. But I don't see that often uh, in the German case, not in the way that uh, you see it in other militaries. Mm-hmm. And right before combat, perhaps it would be dangerous for them to be intoxicated, right? Exactly, and so I think that that's one of the things that uh, that's one of the issues that uh, yeah, that you do see is uh, in Vietnam, for example, American servicemen uh, when they drank or when they took narcotics, it's normally not when they go out into the field because that's the dangerous time for them, right? It's when they come back to their bases that they engage in those kinds of behaviors of drinking or uh, or taking drugs, right? Because that's where that's a more safe environment if you're if you're uh, if you're incapacitated when you go out uh, on a mission that's that's a much more dangerous situation for them mm-hmm. so now talking about the final days of the reich uh, many people back then committed suicide when they know when they knew the war was basically over and they couldn't do anything about it so did alcohol also play a role there in facilitating suicide do we know anything about it you know that there has been work done on uh, on suicides, uh, and I do think, in fact, that um, some people might have used alcohol. But what I have not found is I haven't found a direct connection between alcohol use uh, and suicide. Uh, so um, that's not something that my research has determined. There has been, as I said, some research done by others and looking at there are a number of suicides at the end of the war. Uh, many of those individuals, uh, because they can't imagine, right, this world without uh, without Hitler, or without the Nazi party. So you do see that or fear of, uh, you know, fear of losing the war, or whether it's the Russians coming from uh, from the east uh, or it's uh, other allied troops. But that's not something uh, that uh, that I have seen in my own in my own research. But I do think one thing that's important to say about alcohol use in general is that the Holocaust would have happened without alcohol, right? It's not something that's necessary or sufficient to explain uh, the the Holocaust, but the way it's used gives us insights uh, into the way the perpetrators thought about what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So the war ends and then we have the Nuremberg trials. Was alcohol used as an alibi there in any way? Yeah, that's a really good question. Hajimar Schacht, for example, who's one of the uh, uh, defendants uh, at the trial, the uh, uh, the uh, finance minister, he actually has some testimony that I cite in the book where he attempts to use alcohol as an alibi. He's saying, you know, 
really the the people that I knew, these were good people. And the only way they went along with what was going on was by drinking, uh, or he in, in this case also talks about the use of narcotic drugs. So what you start to see is you start to see this creation of this alibi uh, that I talked about earlier, that the only way that individuals could be involved in these kinds of actions was by drinking or you know, intoxicating themselves in order to be able to do it. And you see that same type of um, that same type of argument used by different policemen and police testimonies uh, that the only way that they could participate or what happened after they participated was to get drunk so that they would forget what they became involved in. Now we do know. Uh, we do know, in fact, that alcohol did have psychological effects on some people for coping. But the other thing I think is important uh, that the book talks about is those individuals who said, I couldn't sleep. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that happened. Or I had stomach problems uh, when I was doing this. Well, if you're drinking uh, he heavy alcohol use, one of the physiological effects is going to be on your ability to sleep well. It's going to also be on uh, uh, stomach issues or, uh, you know, uh, physiological issues that you, if you're drinking a lot every day, there are going to be manifestations. But I do think that what we see is a narrative starts to develop uh, after the war that tries to use uh, alcohol as an excuse for actions. Uh, and uh, that obviously is something that I don't think uh, represents the majority of alcohol use during the war. Mm -hmm. But did those arguments work? I mean, did the judges, I'm not sure if they had any juries back then, but did it work with the people that were evaluating the case? In some cases. So, for example, if you could prove uh, that you were uh, full tongue height, which means like completely, uh, completely intoxicated, it would see it would be seen as a mitigating factor in your sentencing. Uh, and so it could be seen even during the war. Uh, if someone was brought up, it could be seen uh, after after the war in these uh, in these trials. It can be seen as a mitigating factor in explaining behaviors or excusing behaviors. And one of the one of the things that we know about uh, German justice uh, after World War II is that many of the individuals who were the judges in this case were actually Nazi judges or had been part of the Third Reich's legal system. So they look for these kinds of mitigating factors in some cases to go ahead and use those to excuse behavior uh, of individuals and diminish their responsibility. So we do see that in some of the proceedings after the war. Mm -hmm. So one last topic I would like to talk about because we've already talked about geography, do do you know if nowadays, I mean, with the separation that then occurred between East and West Germany after the war, uh, do do you know if any of these cultural traits have lasted until today and differentiate people who lived on one or the other side of the of the wall? Yeah, that's. Um, I think that this is one of the things that uh, is a great question for future research. Uh, for example, one of the things that I've talked about uh, with uh, with some of my colleagues is uh, domestic violence under the Third Reich. This perception of male control over women does it continue in the 1950s and 1960s in German society? Do we see that some of these men who came back uh, after having been socialized? Uh, in World War II or under the Third Reich, do they do they bring these same behaviors back into post-war Germany? And uh, your your question is a good one. Is there a difference in the way that um, perceptions of masculinity, for example, are uh, exhibited in East Germany versus West Germany? And uh, again, I think that that's a subject worthy of its own research topic and would be interesting to see uh, if some of these behaviors kind of continue over decades or we see the influence of these behaviors longer term in German society in general. Mm -hmm. But would you have any predictions about that? I definitely think that uh, it, we would see, uh, I think there would be residual behaviors because one of the things I think we know is if I look at uh, Western European and U.S. society, uh, 
in the 1950s and 1960s. If you have ever watched Mad Men, I don't know if Mad Men uh, uh, is, yeah. is it, you see that drinking is incorporated right into into everyday usage. The way that which men view women, uh, objectify women, uh, is part of I think a cultural time period. Now, if we if we continue forward into contemporary period, I think it also depends on which groups we're talking about. So, for example, uh, rugby teams uh, have a very masculine image of heavy drinking, uh, and we've had uh, cases of also uh, pilots or military pilots being in that in that group. And in the United States, we had the hook scandal with Navy pilots, a, a, a party that they had kind of in Las Vegas where they were heavy drinking, um, uh, sexual aggression against women. So I think that we continue to see some of those behaviors. Uh, and the question, uh, the question is, is, are those limited to specific kinds of groups? that kind of elevate this masculine, this belief in masculinity? Uh, and are those are those kinds of behaviors that are now slowly being, uh, you know, uh, uh, being kind of socially deconstructed as, you know, uh, different laws, different practices of drinking uh, come into play. But I do think that there, uh, we definitely could see specific groups, like I said, gang culture uh, in the United States is one where we see some of those behavior still today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the book is again drunk on genocide, alcohol and mass murder in Nazi Germany. Dr. Westerman, just before we go, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, well, I'm on uh, Facebook, so I, I have a Facebook account, and uh, I'm uh, at the Texas A&M University San Antonio, as you talked about there. So a Google search will definitely uh, give you my email if you want to uh, share an insight or ask a question. I'd be more than happy uh, to respond to any viewers who would like more information. Uh, and uh, if they're uh, if they're so inclined, uh, Amazon has always got, has the book, so they're they're more than welcome to uh, to take a look at what uh, what some of the critics have said about the book. And again, I want to thank you for this opportunity, Ricardo, uh, to spend this much time talking about the book in your interest. Yeah, it's been my pleasure, and thank you for writing it. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. So it is thanks to people like you that the show has been running for such a long time, more than three years now. And I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, you can also find links to it in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like, hit the subscription button and comment on it. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Kenny Litzka, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bernardo Wolf, Tim Hollis, Enrique Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Bosch, Bo Weingart, Becker Newberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Plyf, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenk, Walla Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliz, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Max Bailby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Alman, my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardis France and Niroban Balachandran, 
and my executive producers Michelle Rogieski, Rosie, James Pratt and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.